Now, if you've been working with Windows for a while, you probably remember what a security nightmare VB script was. Microsoft built it into almost every product, and I think they immediately regretted it. So when they sat down at Microsoft to produce Windows PowerShell, and they said, we are going to produce something that has scripting capabilities, I promise you red flags went off, women and children screamed, men gnashed their teeth, and it was really, really traumatic. So they decided to make PowerShell as secure by default as they possibly could. And it is secure by default. By default, PowerShell won't run scripts at all. You can require that scripts be digitally signed in order to run them. The PS1 file name extension isn't even associated with the shell, so you can't just double click a script to run it. And to run a script, you have to specify a path. And that helps avoid something called command hijacking. So we're going to take a few minutes and look at these secure by default or SBD features in Windows PowerShell. Windows PowerShell is so secure by default that it won't even run scripts. It has something called an execution policy, which is set to restricted by default, preventing scripts from running. You can modify this execution policy so that any script will run, so that scripts downloaded from the internet or received by email must be signed before they'll run, or so that all scripts must be signed before they'll run. The all signed policy, which requires all scripts to be digitally signed, is my favorite. It's the safest for a production environment. You might think it's a hassle having to sign your scripts, but you'll think it's a bigger hassle when a malicious script makes short work of your environment. Now, so what is signing? A digitally signed PS1 file contains a signature block, which is a set of encoded comments at the end of a file. The signature indicates that the script has not been modified since being signed, and it contains the identity of the person who signed the script. So if the script turns out to be malicious, you know who wrote it. Here's an overview of how it works. Let's say you've got this script and you've got a computer you want to run it on. Somewhere out there is a CA, that's Certification Authority, and it might be an internal CA or a commercial one like VeriSign. That CA produces a digital certificate for you, which you use to digitally sign your script. The signature itself appears as an encoded block of comments at the end of the script file, and when you try to run the script, PowerShell asks itself three questions. First, is the script signed? Second, is the signature intact? That guarantees that the script itself hasn't changed since it was signed and that the signature hasn't been tampered with. Finally, does the computer trust the CA that issued the certificate? And if all of these checks pass, then the script is allowed to execute. So PowerShell provides two commandlets, get execution policy and set execution policy, which let you work with the execution policy on your computer. You can also download an ADM template that extends group policy so that you can centrally control the execution policy by using Active Directory. One of PowerShell's important secure by default features is the association of the PS1 file name extension, which is what PowerShell scripts use. By default, these files are associated with Windows Notepad, so double-clicking them opens them for editing rather than executing them in the shell. This helps prevent malicious scripts from being emailed to unknowing users who double-click them and end up executing something that damages their systems. PowerShell also helps defeat a type of attack called command hijacking, where a script, using the same name as a command, is executed instead of the command. Unlike commands, which don't require you to specify a path, you do have to specify a path when running a PowerShell script. That's because PowerShell doesn't even search the local directory when you run a script. You have to specify a folder. This helps to visually distinguish scripts from commands and helps prevent command hijacking. Let's quickly look at the security features in PowerShell. I'm going to start by setting my execution policy to restricted, which is the out-of-the-box default. Next, I'll change to the test folder on my computer and take a look at what's there. Um, I can see there's a script here called sample, but if I try to run it, I get an error telling me that script execution is disabled. So let's set the execution policy to remote signed and try to run the script again, but without specifying a path. This time I'm told that the script can't be found. That's because when I run a script or command that isn't in the system search path, I must specify a path. So I'll specify the current folder and try one last time, and now the script runs. Now let's set the execution policy to all signed and run the script again. As you can see, it doesn't run, because that script doesn't have a signature. I'll use type to display the contents of a signed script, and you can see the signature block that was added to the end of the file. 
I'll run this script and it executes because PowerShell was able to verify the signature on the file. A few PowerShell commandlets have a credential parameter, which accepts either a username or a special credential object. This allows you to specify alternate credentials for those commandlets under certain circumstances. Get WMI object is a good example since it allows you to specify alternate credentials when you're using it to manage a remote computer. If you provide a username for the credential parameter, you'll get a graphical dialog prompting you for a password. There's no way around this. PowerShell doesn't provide any means of passing a clear text password on the command line because it's simply too big a security risk. So let's talk about usefulness. Today, in PowerShell version 1, only the get WMI object commandlet actually supports the use of alternate credentials. Future versions of Windows PowerShell, however, will expand this support so that more commandlets, potentially even all the commandlets, have the ability to work with alternate credentials, especially when making connections to remote computers. Having to repeatedly type a username and password can get old, though, so PowerShell provides a commandlet called getCredential. This will prompt you, but will allow you to securely store the resulting credential object in a variable, which you can then use more than once. I like to run getCredential in my Windows PowerShell startup profile, so that I'm prompted whenever the shell runs, and then I have a credential object in a variable that I can use whenever I need without being prompted for the password again. So let me quickly demonstrate how PowerShell can store alternate credentials for later reuse. Here I'm using a variable, and I realize I haven't covered variables yet, but trust me, dollar sign cred is a variable, and I'm using it to store the results of get credential. I specified the administrator username, and you can see that I'm graphically prompted for the password. This is PowerShell's only behavior. You cannot provide the password on the command line. When I look to see what's in the variable, I see that it's a credential for administrator and that the password is stored in memory as a secure string. And I should probably mention profiles. A profile is just a PS1 file that has a specific name and is located in a specific folder that automatically executes every time the shell loads. Now there are different profiles. There's a per user profile and a machine wide profile. Your per user profile, your profile, is the one you'll use most and it does not exist by default. Even the folder doesn't exist by default. You have to create it. Once you do, you simply fill that file with whatever commands you want PowerShell to run every time it starts, and it will. So where does it go? Well, you're going to put it in your Documents folder. So in Windows XP, this would be on Profiles and Settings, under Your Name, and then My Documents. On Windows Vista, it would be Users, Your Name, and then Documents. Within your Documents folder, create a folder called Windows PowerShell. No spaces, all one word. The file name you need to create is microsoft.powershell underscore profile dot ps1. You can do this just by doing the right click and explore, creating a new text file and giving it that name. Make sure it gets a ps1 file name extension, not txt. And remember, neither the folder nor the file exists by default. These only exist if you create them. Here's an example profile. As you can see, it's just a text file that uses specific file name and which is stored in a specific location. The file simply consists of a list of PowerShell commands that I want to run each time the shell starts. So I'll start the shell now, and you can see that the first command in my profile does indeed run, prompting me for a credential. That credential is stored in a variable cred, and my profile outputs a reminder to that effect. Now I have that credential stored and available to me anytime I want to use it, and I won't need to be prompted for it again. Please pause this video now and follow the instructions in your lab guide to complete this lab. There are hints in the lab guide if you need them, and try to complete the lab without referring to the solution in your lab guide. When you're done, resume this video and I'll review a sample solution with you. Let's see how you did on lab 6-1. For task 1, I ran set execution policy remote signed. You should select an execution policy that's appropriate for your computer based on any organizational security policies. I will tell you that anything less than all signed can present significant security vulnerabilities that aren't readily apparent, so be sure to do your research. For task two, I simply ran the test script, being sure to specify its path. For test, task three, you should have found two commandlets, get authentic code signature and set authentic code signature. Finally, for tasks 4 and 5, you should refer to the back of your lab guide for sample solutions.